Damn good. All right, everybody, it's Wednesday. It's actually the vice president debate happening right now. So if you're with us, we appreciate it. If you're not with us, we get it. We want you to be plugged in to what is happening politically. But for those of you all who are here, we're gonna to talk to you all today about um, what actually happens to the stock market during political times or in years of um, election years. So Leon, if you can give them an overview. Yeah, so we, we got a lot of, lot of questions the last couple months. Um, people asking, you know, like what happens during election years with, with the stock market? And Brent and I always say, you know, we always kind of preface that conversation with just look out for volatility. And, and volatility is typically defined by the market going down. Uh, anytime we say volatility, I mean, volatility typically means up and down. But generally, when we say volatility, we're talking about using it when the market is, is, is dropping some. So, um, so yeah, during, during years of, of, of elections, the market typically goes down to sideways. Uh, and so we've gotten a lot of questions, people saying, you know, what, you know, what happened? And, and remember, you know, like anything, nothing's absolute, right? So some years the market will be up during election year, some years the market will be down during election year. Uh, and nothing that kind of affects it is whether the incumbent wins or we have a new president. So we're gonna present some data today that, that kind of breaks all that down uh, and shows in, in, interesting. Oh, also, <laughs> another thing that's probably gonna cause some strife is we're gonna show uh, how the market performs uh, under either a Democratic uh, governing president, president or a Republican president. And there's actually some pretty big, there's a pretty wide gap in the returns you get underneath uh, either one of those presidents. So we'll, uh, we'll be presenting that information today. Yeah, and this is important again, because so many people think it, it doesn't matter or, you know what, is I wasn't gonna go into the market anyway. Hopefully all the information we show you just leads you back to the fact that you should be invested regardless. Um, be it volatility or be it just, um, I'm just now getting understanding of the market and I don't wanna invest. And actually someone has said this to me personally, I don't know the market and I definitely don't wanna get in during an election year. So we're gonna, we're gonna kind of just unwrap all of that now. And for everybody who's listening, this is a great time to share it um, with a friend. If you know somebody who you think can benefit from this information, if you're part of an investment club or you know any other group that loves content like this, I'm getting some texts coming in right now, but this is a great time to, to do the share. And for everybody, everybody listening to our podcast, thank you for listening, the IA podcast has become much more popular. As you know, we are now on Amazon. So we're gonna put out a list later on this week, just letting everyone know where they can find us. And it's going to be awesome to get you all to download and increase the engagement of that podcast because it helps us grow. And it also does what Leon and I set out to do is bring this content to like our homes, You know, bring this content to our dinner tables so we can start talking about it and it's not new information is just kind of how we talk. That's when we really won. All right, you wanna jump in? Uh, yeah, so yeah, we want, yeah, like Brent said, we want this to be normal. We want this to be normal conversation. We don't want this to be uh, abnormal. We don't want this to be something that is kind of, you know, talked about uh, just with your friends or, or even just with your family. You want to share, have it shared with your family and friends. So uh, we know a lot of other communities, these conversations are very normal. Uh, they have been daily. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to get it to where our community, people of color, African-Americans, Black Americans, you know, make this, make this normal conversation. So, um, okay, so here's the first, first bit of information. This is really interesting, right? So what we have up here is a slide showing um, how the market reacts to when, when a, an incumbent president wins or when a new president wins, and then just for all presidents, uh, when an election year happens, so we'll go through each one. So on the left-hand side of the, of the graph, um, you see that when, when, a, when a new president is elected, that, so what this is covering is that year. So this is from uh, 1928 through 2019. So these, these are the averages for that, for whatever huge amount of time that is from 1928, 2019. Um, so on average, when a new president wins, when a, when a new president is elected in, the, in, in an election year, the market does about 9.3%. It's up at about 9.3% in that year. Uh, so we're gonna just ignore the white, the, the yellow bars. That's uh, that's for bonds, and we're not we're not really concerned with that. Um, so again, new president is elected in, in an election year. The market does about nine point three percent. Now, when um, an incumbent, the president who's already in office, wins when they get when they win re-election, the market does about thirteen point four percent. 
And if you think, you think about it, that makes sense because um, when a new president comes in, there's a lot of uncertainty, you know, his, his or her policies. Um, I mean, <laughs> we see with Trump, it's, it's, it can go way outside of just policies. It can be a whole lot of other things that are unknown when, when a new president comes in. So when a new president comes in, the market performs less than when an incumbent wins because again, it's that uncertainty. That person is an unknown. Whereas an incumbent, when they win, it's a known, it's a known commodity. Their policies are pretty much known. Um, you know, and, and, and if they have, if they're going to make changes in the next turn, that's probably already been um, uh, explained to the, to the electorate as is. So, and also, you know, in this, some of you all may have recently read the headlines that cause just black people to be upset, to say the least, um, Bob Johnson. And, you know, when he made his statement that I'd rather deal with the devil known than one unknown, it goes back to the point Leon's making. From a business owner standpoint, he's so fearful of what you know, what will happen to policies for corporations that he's willing to deal with what we have right now, which if anybody's willing to deal with it, that's pretty impressive. Or, you know, it's like, it says a lot. Now I shouldn't even say impressive, but it says a lot that they'd be willing to deal with it. But you think about these corporations, they're responsible for so many people's livelihoods. Um, just, I mean, right now we're talking about unemployment in the US is over 40 million people. So whoever comes in, they have a huge mountain to hike and the caverns are deep and long and wide and how they're gonna get across them, you know, it's gonna be interesting. And, and, and let's, just, let's just put this out there. Trump, <laughs> Trump is, is the, he's what they call a black swan event, right? So in, in finance and in the market, a black swan event is something like with COVID, like something that's just unforeseen, it could have never been planned for. And you know, during the COVID drop, the market dropped uh, 35% in a month, right? Nobody saw that coming. Trump was also a complete anomaly. Nobody saw him coming, nobody saw him winning, nobody saw the way his president his run, has been run coming. So he was a complete anomaly. So what we're showing you here is that, again, uh, on average, a uh, new president, the market performs about, performs about 9.3%. If, if the incumbent wins, the current president wins, it's about 13.4%. 13, 13 this is on average. Again, Trump probably doesn't doesn't fit these numbers because again, when you're dealing with somebody that's a complete unknown and a complete anomaly, he's out he's outside the norm, right? So um, we don't know we don't know what the market's going to do this year if he wins or loses. Uh, so I just want to put out that put that out there that that he's just he's kind of an anomaly and like a black swan event for the market. Now the middle, um, no no, just go back one more. We just covered the middle portion. Yeah. So the middle the middle um, bar is showing you for all elections, right? So in an election year, on average, regardless of who wins or loses, the market does about 11.3%. So uh, and remember, typically on average, in general, the market does about 10 to 10.5%. So in election year, uh, no matter who wins, the market performs, actually performs a little better than, than, the, than the, uh, the, the average. But just to recap, um, so in, in an election year, when you have a new president, a new president is elected, the market does about 9.3%. And in an election year, when the current president or the incumbent wins, the market does about 13.4%. Okay, so this is another inter interesting slide. This is one that <laughs> may cause a little controversy uh, because, you know, people are, this is, as I say, this is, this is a very um, partisan time we live in. But this is just raw data, and, you know, you can interpret it as, as, you, as you see, but the data is the data. So, um, this is showing from, I'm just gonna look away from my screen because it's a little small on the, on the thing, but the, the data, this is from 1929 through 2016, right? So we're, we're talking about back to Herbert Hoover through Barack Obama. Um, and what this shows is that uh, on average, uh, <laughs> the returns under a democratic president uh, over a four year period is 57.44%. That's how much the market returned for Democrats, for a democratic president. For Republicans, it's way less, down at 16.61%. That's, that's, over, that's over a four-year period. That's a complete four-year period for a president. Now, that, on the right, Leon, oh, sorry. For anybody who's thinking, like, where did you guys get these numbers from? Um, they're coming from Bloomberg. And, you know, I, I know this is one where you want to know the source. But also, if you pull the YouTube um, links or the YouTube footage, of Warren Buffett talking about the presidential effects on the stock market. He actually echoes this in his um, conversations. I wanna say it's at Georgetown University and it might've been 2000, might've been like 2000, I don't know. Don't hold me to this, but 2010. But essentially 
um, he, he echoes the same sentiment that the market tends to do better with democratic leadership uh, when in the um, presidential seat. Did, did, did he say, did he say why? He said it was kind of similar to what you're saying. We still don't know why, but he he gave some he gave something around it. But even when he was saying it, I was kind of like, I don't get it. And so it was equivalent to around '87 when the market crash hit. It was again, it was one of the few crashes that they never were able to pinpoint why it happened. So right. it was along those anomalies in the market, and that was part of the conversations. Right, and so with, with this, so just so just going back to the chart real quick. So on the right hand side, um, it shows the uh, the per year average, right? So the, so the one we the one we just quoted where Democrats have a Democratic president has over this amount of time from nineteen twenty nine through two thousand and sixteen, Democratic presidents uh, the market returns about fifty seven point four four percent, Republicans about sixteen point six one percent. That's total return over each four year period. Now on the right hand side of this this chart, it's showing that the uh, the per year average. So not over the four years, but just the per year. So for Democrats per year on average, what we always say the market does, for on a Democrats it turn, returns about 10.8%. Then the Republicans it turns, returns about 1.71%. So what this shows again is that, you know, on, on average, again, um, Democrat Democratic presidents, uh, the market generally uh, does better. Now I wanna say, I wanna make this point. This is um, a correlation, it's not causation, right? So we're not saying that when you have a democratic president in it all that causes the market to to go up more than under republicans it's not what we're saying at all that's not what the data shows all the data shows is that for whatever reason and like brent just said we don't we don't know the reason Warren buffett doesn't know the reason um but for whatever reason there's a correlation between when the, when democrats are in office and when the market uh does better than when republicans in office and the market does worse so again it's it's a correlation it's not causation you can't say just because the democrats in office the market's going to do well that's not true that's not what the data shows and uh, so then slide three. So this is really what matters, right? I mean, ultimately, only thing we care about, I know like Brent and I always say here at IA, this is our main point is uh, long term. Yep, three, and five, real quick, and three. for everybody listening to the podcast right now, we're, we just pulled up a chart that shows growth of a dollar invested in the S&P 500, January 1926 through December 2019. And again, these are things that are fascinating to me. I love I love charts like these because it helps you understand what one dollar can do, like the power of one dollar. And so, you know, Leon and I, we oftentimes talk about the fact that, you know, if you get money in any form or fashion, if you receive a paycheck, if you're getting a uh, stipend, if you're getting an allowance, if you're getting um, an annuity payout, whatever, if you get a dollar, you essentially are an employer. Your dollar is the employee. The question is how good of an employer are you? Can you manage that dollar properly? And so when we look at this, this chart um, of the growth of a dollar in S&P 500 from January 1926 to December 2019, this is gonna make for some interesting conversation. And we, we are bringing the stock picks to you at the end. Um, both Leon and I will have our stock picks but there are also going to be some nuggets in this chart that we'll, we'll talk about. Yeah, so so the, the real main point of this chart, I mean, as Brent said, it shows the dollar from 1926 through 2019. But the, but you know, dealing with the, dealing with the elections, what we're showing is that it, it also it also highlights um, each presidential term. So it goes from Coolidge and I guess the, the, early, the late 20s, all the way you know from Roosevelt, Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, yada yada yada, up on through Trump. And I mean, what you visually look at this and see it doesn't really matter which president's in office, right? I mean, each president, yes, there are dips and some, some dips are bigger than other, uh, some dips are bigger under certain presidents than others. But again, if you're in the market long-term, um, you're fine. Cause you see the, the chart goes from the bottom left to the upper right with a few dips in between. But I mean, if you look at this chart, I mean, we're talking going back since 1926, those dips are minor uh, in, in the grand scheme of things. Now, of course, if you're in it, if you, if, if you're sat through the, you know, the 2011, um, sorry, 2001 terrorist, terrorist attack or the credit crisis in 2008, 2009, it hurt like hell, right? But you see, again, Bush was in office, Republican market typically does worse under them. Um, but what happened? Obama came in. Now remember, it's not because Obama is a Democrat that the market did better under him. It's just, it's just, it's just for whatever reason, that's the way it worked out. But when that, when the market pulled back, we then went higher. So, um, so what this is showing is that Ultimately, it doesn't even matter who the president is, right? 
Only thing that matters, because remember, the, the, the stock market is a reflection of the U.S. economy. As long as the U.S. economy continues to grow, the stock market in general will grow over time. There will be dips in between, but over time, the market will go up. So, um, so this again, this just shows that the president doesn't really matter in the long term. Yeah, even if you look at 1929, that's the um, Great Depression, right? Um, the Great Depression, I think the market recessed the largest amount in history at, Leon, you know, just correct my math or my um, interest rate, is it? 39 percent in one day that what that the market recessed right before the when the great depression hit the one day yeah. the one day it was, yeah it was something it's yeah. 39 or 42 or somewhere in that space but crazy. Mm -hmm. it's the longest depression of the market in history and it still only lasted three to four years so mm -hmm. you, you really think about that the, the great depression i'm talking you couldn't go they put bars in front of banks because they would not let people come take their money out. They, I mean, essentially, they tried to kick in the doors of Wall Street. And so you look at the, the environment that this was, and it was the worst time for the market ever. And it still recovered fairly quickly from a time standpoint. And, you know, we talk about this too a lot inside of IEA. Time is the great healer. And we say it in different ways and different forms. But if you have time to weather the storms in the market, in most cases, unless you, you pick, you know, sometimes we pick bad stocks, um, the market recovers in some form or fashion, and your, which means your investment probably will recover depending on how you mentally deal with it. All these charts, these things are including for the oil embargo, the um, World War I, World War II, Great Depression, um, Kuwait. I mean, it's everything that you can think of is in this chart. But what do we always want to see when we look at a stock chart? We want to look for left bottom, right top. And that's still what you're getting with the chart. So for all of you all who are out there thinking, oh, the market's rigged. Um, you know, I'm better off in a bank. Hopefully you saw our, our live last Wednesday, if you're saying that. But if you haven't, look at the chart. Look at the chart. And I want to say they said if you took roughly, and this it's inside the IEA, so these numbers are going to be off. But if you took roughly six thousand three hundred dollars and invested it for your child at birth, by the time the, and just track the S and P five hundred, it is thought that by the time that child reach age sixty five, they will be a millionaire from that investment. Now. You look at charts like this and you kind of get it. You're talking about $1 over the course of, since 1926 to 2019, $1 being worth $10,000, $1. So just think about that. Yeah, yeah, just, so it just I mean, I mean, to your point, Brent, like looking at uh, around Hoover, uh, I guess it's Hoover, yeah, around the um, Great Depression, I think it's showing. Mm -hmm. This, that's the only time that this chart is showing that the market actually went negative. So if you think about all the stuff that we've lived through, you know, the, the um, I mean, depending on how old you are, but saying Brent for Brent and I, uh, you know, we were born in the late 70s, 76. So we were we were born right around the time, I think there were oil issues, uh, there were interest rates issues in the 80s, of course, the 87 crash, 2011, um, the terrorist attacks, mm -hmm. Great Depression, Great Recession in 08, 09. Right. I mean, if you look at you look at this chart, all those things happened and we're still at all-time highs right now. I mean, we're, we're just bumping up against all-time highs right now in the market um, in, in the S&P 500. So yeah, I mean, it just, it, again, it comes back to the president, really doesn't matter. Again, on the long-term, short-term in May, um, as those numbers showed that, that you know the, the market typically does better under Democrats and Republicans, but long-term, it really doesn't matter as this, this chart shows. It doesn't even matter who the president is long-term. And then here are the key takeaways uh, from from this uh, from this live, so we're saying during election year, uh, incumbent presidents winning re-election is better for the stock market. Better for stock market returns, uh, as we showed. Um, when an incumbent wins, the market does usually does about thirteen point four percent in that year of the election. Uh, stock market performance. I want to. We got to say this. Okay. Normally, Trump is an anomaly, and yeah. you know whoever's watching this, you can have your feelings, but whether you support him or not you have to admit these guys off the hinges. And so in that space, there is no telling what policies 
he would put in place. And honestly, there's so much um, dissent between whether you know they want him in or out. If he were to not win, I don't know if this would follow the normal. The incumbent does the best. So I'm. That's just that's Brent speaking. I'm not speaking for IEA. It's just my thought. I, he's an anomaly. He's 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 a wild card. So yeah, that's my thought. Yeah, he's a total wild card. Uh, second point is the stock market performs better under Democratic presidents versus Republican presidents. Uh, again, it's not causation. It's a correlation. Uh, we don't know why it happens. We're not saying Democrats alone make the market go up. It's not what we're saying at all. We're just saying the data shows, on average, markets perform better when Democratic presidents are in office than Republicans. Just, it just is what it is. Uh, and finally, uh, regardless of which party holds the presidency, the stock market over the long term continues to go higher. And that's the last chart we showed where it uh, didn't matter who the president was, didn't matter what the effect was, whether it be oil, war, um, recession, what have you, the market, that chart went from bottom left to upper right through all types of issues. Um, yeah. So again, the president long-term doesn't really matter. The market really doesn't care. And you know, when you look at how you're investing, um, what you're investing in matters more than anything else. If you're ahead of, there's, is, um, Jim Cramer always says, there's always a bull market somewhere. And if you know how to invest, it's true. And if you know how to lay out a strategy, it's true. But also think about this. It's not always a bad thing to have a, a correction in the market. It's not, it's, it's, if your money's positioned properly and you have the ability, and I know not everybody has it. So we're, we're saying if you do have the ability to take advantage of the dips in the market, that is when you can have higher returns. And, you know, some people look at like this, this gloomy thought of if the market is red at all, on any day by default, that's a bad stock. Right. And it's, it's not accurate. And for um, anybody who thinks that that's true, it's, it's not. And, you know, you have to give the market time to behave the way the market behaves, which means there are peaks and valleys in the trend of it going bottom left, top right. And until the market can, you know, stops, no one knows what the top is. And then mm -hmm. that's the thing. So we don't know what the behavior of the market will be long term but we can absolutely tell you inside of investing education academy if you're in a savings account you're losing slowly and it's it's no it's no way around it it's just true so and, and when, when i say about this about when uh markets go down um so it, it it amazes me that like stocks are the only thing in the world where people don't like discounts right like you go buy a car on discount. If, if you know if you know a car is worth five thousand, but it's selling for two thousand, you're gonna jump all, all over it. When you know stores have sales, we run by them. Um, home home prices when they're you know when when a, a home is selling for less than the comps, we love it. It's only when stocks go. I mean, even when people don't even own the stocks, like if you're looking at you know AT and T, Microsoft, Verizon, big name stocks. When people see that the stock is down, they panic. Like, oh, I can't buy it. Oh, oh I can't buy it. You know, it's, it's a bad time to buy it. I'm like, it's a quality company and it's on sale. It's only the stock market where people have this issue with buying things on sale. I never understand it. I always tell people, you know, if it's a quality, quality company, you want to wait for those days. Not when I say, not necessarily wait, but you want to um, dollar cost average in on the days when the market is dropping. So I, I mean, that, that's what I live for. I live for down days. Yeah. Uh, like I said before, during the COVID, the COVID drop, I was down almost 40%. But I was buying. I mean, it hurt my hell to see my account down that down that much. But I knew over the long term the market was going to recover. So I bought like crazy uh, during the COVID drop, and I'm you know sitting pretty in a lot of those a lot of those uh, investments now. So not sitting pretty, totally in those investments. Uh, just, just I'm just saying, buy buy some discounts. I mean, it, it works. <laughs> and you know, truthfully, it's it saddens us to say, but normally the people who have those thoughts are unsophisticated investors, and. Many of black people, let's call it what it is, are unsophisticated investors because we didn't grow up talking about this. You know, we, you know, sometimes we were looking at the quick flip or the hustle about money and we weren't taught patience. We weren't taught the, um, you know, kind of run towards the investment when it's down and continue to ride it up. You know, and, we, and we're always looking for like, not we, not always, but oftentimes I hear people saying, well, I'm a buy low and sell high what like what is high to you what is low to you and we don't write it down we don't create actual framework around what you can you can create framework for like what is your strategy and these are things that we talk about inside investing education academy because we don't want our 
you know, investors or, you know, our members really just thinking, oh, well, high is where it's at today. Low is where I emotionally feel like it is. And there's no data to back it up. You, if you're going to be in the market, make data-driven decisions and understand that you should be investing risk capital. Normally, I do the, the you know lineup from Leon to swing the bat, but in this case, it's just real talk. You have to understand you shouldn't be playing with your baby's college fund and they're going to school in two years. You shouldn't be playing with your parents' um, retirement account and they're already on some type of very important medicine. That's that's a bad strategy, and so if you're getting advice from you know people that just they they either have their own agenda on why they're telling you what they're telling you, or they don't have the experience to truthfully give you professional advice. Think about the source. I mean that's that's it. Think about the source of where you're getting your information, and there's something called regression to the mean, which I won't go into too much right now, but it just looks at the what a person was um, kind of goes back to when they don't have a safe environment or when they don't know what's going on. And if your mean is like an IEA or any other good organization with people who understand the market and they have your best interest in mind, when you regress back to that mean, it's the right place to be. When you're in the market and you're regressing back to the mean, it's like the friends you grew up with who none of them have ever traded stock besides casually, that's the wrong mean to regress back to. So not to go too far into that, but it's, it's important to say, and we're in election year, it's going to get rough. And, you know, going up to November, we are in an election year with the wild card. I mean, it, yeah. it, regardless of what anybody says, support or don't support Trump, no one knows what he'll say tomorrow. Like, you know, he, he'll tweet that he's not doing stimulus and then tweet two, two hours later that he is. And these things have a very profound effect on the market. And so if you aren't able to stomach this, or if it's causing you a certain amount of duress, I would ask you to ask yourself, what type of money do you have invested in the market? Please be responsible as you invest. Um, we're about to give you our stock picks. And even with our stock picks, you know, we say never follow a guru blindly. Um, when we suggest these stocks, it's purely we're saying these are stocks that you should give strong consideration to. We're not, and we're not, and, and we're not gurus. We're not gurus. Yeah, we're not. So we're not <laughs> I really don't think anybody really is. I mean, yeah, nobody. Yeah, right. If you listen to Warren Buffett even talk, he talks a lot about his circle of um, comfort, and he was like, he basically buys and sells within his circle. Oh, nobody called it um, circle of competency, and so he was like, he buys and sells things that are based in his circle of competency. He knows about these markets. He knows about value-based investing. He knows about dividend-paying stocks. And that's what he does. And he does it very well. But, you know, some of us, we just read the paper and we make a move. And it's, it's just the wrong thing to do, it's especially in the environment we're in right now. So um, with that being said, remember that <laughs> we have a storm to weather. <laughs> it is it is going to be the 2020 election. However, it turns out, I really don't think this is going to follow the normal path of, um, I really don't feel like it's going to follow the normal path of the incumbent winning and the market being happy. Um, I, I just personally don't think so. So we'll see. But I will say this, I do believe that the market doesn't care in the long run, one way or the other. The market will care and the people in the market will care in the short run, because the reality is the deeper we get into the stock market, the less is actually based off of numbers. It's it's really sad, but it's true. You know, looking at the evolution of the stock market as more Robinhood investors and other new investors rush to the market, it kind of dilutes the old premises of certain rationales about the market behavior because it's these, these new segments of people in the market and the market's never had a, um, the data to understand the long-term data to understand these new investors. So it becomes really emotional. So, um, and media, media control for the most part, but that's a whole nother thing. Um, Leah, I'm gonna go first. Right. So I have picked today, um, take two, let me share my screen. And for everybody listening to the podcast, these are our stock picks for um, this Wednesday. 
October the 7th. Again, these are just stocks that we think people should give strong consideration to. Um, go out and do your own homework, see if it makes sense to you, see if it feels good to you. We like them. Um, right now, my pick for today is Take Two Interactive Software, and the ticker symbol is TTWO. Again, TTWO. I right now am having a romance with um, the gaming industry because it's new to me. And it's a sector that I never paid much attention to because I don't play video games. Um, but it's also one of those things where it's a difference between being an investor and looking at what makes sense and just being, you know, romanticizing the market strictly for yourself. This is strictly looking at it from an investing standpoint. There's a lot of money to be had in the gaming industry. Um, now, take two, let's see. I don't think they're paying a dividend. I don't believe, yeah, they're not paying a dividend. Um, the stock is trading at $160 a share. And the reason I like take two interactive is there are about three big boys in the gaming um, ecosystem right now as it relates to actually pro to production of new games. And it's um, take two interactive software, EA um, Sports and Activision Blizzard. As this market continues to grow, there are startup companies that now are solely dedicating themselves to esports media. And esports media is paying these three companies, and they're paying more, but these are the three I'm focused on, a lot of money to, to be in alignment with them. Um, and we're talking about just the the visual, like watching sports. They're treating it as if it were a Super Bowl, you know. And somebody, you think about this, gaming. If it really picks up traction, where some of these teams from, let's say Madden or NBA, um, I don't even know the name of it, but an NBA game. If a team gets enough attention and people really start to back these teams. And I mean the teams that are playing the game, not the not the the teams that are the game. The people who are playing the game, if they start getting real backing, you have a system of entertainment that means you don't have to pay any players. It doesn't. No one's getting sick. You can play from anywhere. You can watch from anywhere, and it's the costs are extremely low for the providers, and then the resources from advertising connections and the such the revenue models it's, it's just a win so I, i'm i'm just basing this off of the fact that the market the industry is growing um they're combining gaming very closely to fashion now um i didn't know that either those two markets they collide i think this 160 dollars stock is is going to definitely go up so again it's take two interactive software um the ticker symbol is tt W O and it's trading right now at $160 and 96 cents a share. Um, it was down 0.76% today. All right. Yeah. I like it because I mean, speaking of the, 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 the generation, like my I have two nephews and yo, it's crazy to me. That, and they, I, I, I don't get it, but they do it. They, I mean, they play video games all day. I mean, they, they like what you're talking about is real. Like this generation, I forget whatever they're called. Um, they are all about gaming. Like, from sunup to Sunday, all about gaming. But another thing they do is they watch other people play games. Oh, that was like, what the f is this? like? It was the. I mean, literally, he'll he'll sit in front of the TV or the computer, and it's a guy with, with a headset, and like down the right hand corner in the game, and he's just watching the guy play like Call of Duty. And it's like it's like us watching a movie. Like it's, it was the it's the weirdest thing. I, I don't get it. I don't get to watching people play games thing. But you know, it's it's huge, huge. Twitch, Twitch. I mean, Twitch. The um. Twitch.com, the network owned by Amazon, they're the largest uh, game watching platform now that Microsoft has got at, gotten out of it. So a little shout out there to um, this old, little tidbit there. Amazon is actually part, partly a gaming company too because they own Twitch, which is the largest uh, game watching platform uh, around. So yeah. for one of for the franchises coming out right now, Amazon has over 1.1 million views on some of the games. Yeah. One mm -hmm. point one million views on some of these games. And I mean, so I'll say, I liken it to this, you know, when we were young, we would sit around and watch other people play Tecmo Bowl 
and it was it, we could see them. So but we were there, but we were there with them, laughing with them. You know, like yeah. it was. Yeah. But now, when you're looking at you know Zoom, look at Zoom stock, and look at you know all these these connections, um, virtual connection based engagements. Video games line up so well with that. In a time where you know we're not getting our kids socialized because you know you're doing social distance learning, um, they don't they don't talk on Zoom the way we would, but they'll talk over a game all day. Yeah, yeah, I've seen it. They'll I mean they'll go on to a game just to spend time together. In addition mm-hmm. to the fact that gaming was already addictive before this, so right. you know, you're adding advertisers in, you're getting these advertising dollars. The franchise, it's it's you know what I. Was, you guys, that's my pick. <laughs> Stay tuned, <laughs> interactive. And if you want to, you know, if you want to um, unwrap this, I'm really, I really want to unwrap this inside of the Investing Education Academy platform. Um, it's www.ieamembers.com. I think a lot, is a lot of potential in this marketplace. So. Agreed. Uh, all right. So my pick is a little less sexy, uh, a little less entertaining, but my pick is Starbucks. Uh, oh. Ticker S-B-U-X. Today it closed at 88.45 and was up a it was up 1.65%. Um, reason I chose Starbucks is two reasons. One, everybody knows Starbucks, and just about everybody goes to Starbucks. Uh, I mean, they're almost like they're almost like Walmart, they're almost like Target. You know, these are these are Home Depot. These are, this is a staple company that um, even during COVID wasn't really hit that hard. Um, and I'll, I'll read some numbers here. So. Uh, over the last three years, its its average revenue growth is seven percent. Its average profit growth over the last three years is twenty six percent. So, growth companies are typically defined as companies that grow their uh, profit earnings or profits twenty uh, percent or more per year. So, uh, Starbucks is growing their profits over the last three years twenty six percent. So, Starbucks is actually considered a growth company by you know most most people in Wall Street that categorize growth companies companies that grow their earnings more than twenty percent. So, big company like Starbucks. Is growing its, its profits at 26% uh, on average over the last three years. Uh, and it's also paying a 2.04% dividend yield. So uh, it's paying way more than um, uh, way more than you know any savings account, checking account, CD. Uh, and it's 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 right in line with like my, my threshold is two percent. I want to yield a two percent or more. So it's right at that number, right at that level. Uh, I'd like to be higher, but you know, again, it's Starbucks. Uh, so you can't go wrong with the, the growth there. Um, last quarter, it beat Wall Street's earnings estimates by 22%. So it crushed its earnings estimates that Wall Street had set out. Uh, the stock is up 66% over the last three years. Um, and right now it's back to it's, it's back to right where it was before the COVID drop. So it's recovered basically all the gains it lost uh, during, the, during the meltdown in uh, March, and, uh, March and February and March. So my, that's my pick, Starbucks, ticker symbol SBUX. You said it said 30, I mean, 66% over the last three years? Yeah, yep, it's grown 66% over the last three years. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's 22% per year. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Does that, so that, yeah, and saying that that's double the market, that's double the market average per year over the last three years. Yep. I mean, you think about, so anybody watching, you think about your savings account or even a bond, if you're in a bond right now and you could have been in Starbucks. And actually, I have clients that bought Starbucks just because they drink there a lot. They, they got mm-hmm. coffee all the time. And to get 22% per year. year, that's like yeah. the life of being in a, in a savings account. And I mean, good luck with a bond, but you know, that's interesting. Unless it's a bond from pre-2010. But anyway, everybody, those are our picks today. Starbucks, um, ticker symbol S-B-U-X and Take Two Interactive. Um, ticker symbol is, what was it? TTWO. Yeah, TTWO, yeah. All right. We look forward to talking to you all next Thursday. Um, keep watching the, the, the vice presidential debate. Um, we look forward to some of the conversations that's going to happen inside of the IEA platform, I'm sure, tomorrow. And everybody who's interested in just kind of seeing um, what Investing in Education Academy is about before joining the uh, officially joining the membership platform, you can fake search us on Facebook. It's Investing Education Academy um, on Facebook. You can find the group. There's no cost to join. Um, we welcome you to our Facebook community. There's a lot of great conversation happening there as well. So again, if you're looking to join, um, you can find us on Facebook. Just search Investing Education Academy. You, we should pop up. Um, it, IEA will be in parentheses. 
And if you're interested in just becoming a member, like, you know what, I heard enough. I really need to take my money seriously and get into a community that is, is you know, full of stock enthusiasts and really investing as a whole. You can find us at www.ieamembers.com. Have a great day and we will talk to you all next Thursday, next Wednesday. I'm sorry, next Wednesday, nine o'clock. <laughs>